the topic of my presentation would be about um, a structure of biology using um, paramagnetic NMR. Uh, thanks everyone who joined us today for this seminar. Um, I hope this seminar can give you um, at least a rough understanding of paramagnetic NMR and hopefully some references for your uh, for you to read if you wanted to know more about paramagnetic NMR. Um, everything about this topic is um, not going to be covered here, but um, I will do my best to uh, talk about the things that I believe are important to, to know. Um, I've structured my talk into two parts. Um, the first part is going to be about different paramagnetic metal ions and techniques to immobilize them on proteins. And the second part going to be about uh, pseudoconduct shifts. Um, or PCSs for determining the 3D structure of proteins. Uh, in summary, we are all here for one main reason, and that is structural biology and studying the 3D structure of proteins, uh, which underpins the understanding of um, protein function, protein ligand interaction, uh, interactions, and uh, drug design. There are there are NMR experiments that can um, assist with um, 3D structure determination of proteins, um, including NOEs and chemical shifts and et cetera. Um, but also an alternative way to obtain structural restraints is through um, paramagnetic NMR, which can be detected when, um, when proteins carry paramagnetic metal ions. Uh, paramagnetic metal ions have um, unpaired electrons, uh, which give rise to um, magnetic moment and induce paramagnetic effects in NMR spectra. So the main effects uh, related to the presence of uh, paramagnetic centers are um, pseudoconduct shifts, uh, PCSs, uh, paramagnetic relaxation enhancement, or PREs, and residual dark black coupling, or RDCs. Uh, PCSs, in summary, are, are basically NMR chemical shifts that um, occur uh, due to the paramagnetic molecule and uh, diamagnetic analog. Uh, PREs are increasement of nuclear relaxation rates of paramagnetic um, molecules uh, with respect to those of a diamagnetic analog and also RDCs, uh, which occur due to the partial uh, self-orientation of, um, of molecule. And that is because the uh, probabilities for different orientation of paramagnetic molecule in a magnetic field are not the same anymore. So this partial self-orientation is responsible um, for occurrence of residual doppler coupling. And the presence of um, paramagnetic residual Doppler coupling affects the um, J coupling between nuclei, and that's how we um, actually measure um, RDCs. Um, and this figure nicely shows the differences between these three uh, different effects. So the first step uh, would be to find out which metal ions are um, paramagnetic and which ones are diamagnetic. Um, but the problem is metal ions cannot simply be divided into um, diamagnetic and paramagnetic classes as the magnetic properties depend on um, oxidation state, um, the coordination sphere, and the spin states. For example, um, from the most uh, abundant metal ions that um, can be found in cells, um, uh, which are used as protein cofactors under biological conditions. Um, we can say sodium, potassium, uh, magnesium, calcium, zinc, and cadmium ions are always diamagnetic. Um, whereas the other metal ions that are listed here uh, can potentially be paramagnetic. A good example would be iron plus two. Uh, the good example would be iron metal ions and and cobalt. Um, iron is, um, is the most abundant paramagnetic metal ion in proteins. The most common and stable oxidation state of iron are uh, plus two and plus three, 
low spin iron 2 is diamagnetic in um, octahedral and square planar coordination, whereas um, high spin iron plus 2 and all iron plus 3 complexes um, are pyromagnetic. Uh, similarly for cobalt, um, we have low spin cobalt 3, uh, which, can, which is diamagnetic, and the rest high spin cobalt and all co cobalt plus 2 complexes are pyromagnetic. So the other thing uh, which is very important for um, um, pyromagnetic metal ions is the ligand field. And um, the, I mean, apart from the oxidation state and, and the number of unpaired electrons, um, we have to also consider the, um, the ligand field. Um, as unpaired electron density is um, in part delocalized across orbitals of coordinating ligand molecules, um, the ligand field determines uh, to a large extent the actual magnetic susceptibility of um, the paramagnetic center, and in particular, its um, anisotropy. This has important um, ramification for uh, the mechanism governing PREs and the magnitude of paramagnetic shifts and other anisotropic NMR uh, parameters. Um, the importance of ligand field um, is particularly obvious for, uh, for nickel, uh, which generates sizable PCSs only um, in the non-planar coordination or, or tetrahedral environment, whereas um, square planar complexes are often um, diamagnetic. Um, the key uh, parameters determining uh, the magnitude of PCSs, RDCs, and PREs are um, the magnetic susceptibility and isotropy and the electron relaxation time. These two parameters determine which metal ion is suitable for PRE measurements and which metal ions are suitable for PCS measurements. So metal ions with very low um, paramagnetic susceptibility and isotopy are um, gadolinium, um, manganese, and type 2 copper. Um, therefore, they produce very small, um, usually undetectable PCSs or and, and RDCs. On the other hand, these metal ions have a long electron relaxation time, which induces relatively um, large PREs. In contrast, um, low spin ion uh, plus, plus three and high spin ion plus two, uh, nickel, cobalt, uh, type one copper plus two have short electron relaxation times and a relatively small but uh, but still sizable um, um, PCSs can, can be measured from them. So in conclusion, some metal ions are good for PRE measurements and some good for PCS measurements based on these two parameters. Um, you can see a pictorial summary of um, lanthanide ions here. Um, lanthanide ions are the most attractive um, for paramagnetic NMR studies uh, because different lanthanides have very different uh, magnetic susceptibility tensors and tensor anisotropies. Uh, there, is, uh, there is no uh, metalloproteins in, in the cells that uh, or biomolecules known to contain lanthanides naturally, uh, but it is sometimes possible to um, substitute naturally carrying metal ions such as um, manganese or calcium by uh, lanthanide ions. So this nice summary um, from this reference um, shows that different lanthanide ions have different magnitude of PREs um, and different magnitude of PCSs. And as you can see for um, gadolinium, um, we can record the biggest PREs. Um, and for terbium, uh, the highest positive and for um, tulium, the highest negative uh, PCS is um, delta cell. So these are the most, um, most common 
commonly used uh, paramagnetic metal ion, lanthanide ions used for PCS measurements, um, shortly TB and TM. Again, the ligand field um, for lanthanide ions also can make a big difference. Um, as you can see in this figure, the additional coordination of um, um, C7 tag, uh, which is a, a lanthanide binding tag uh, with the neighboring uh, carboxyl group of aspartic acid can, um, can uh, produce unusually large delta tensor for uh, for this tag. Um, also recorded that delta crisis of some lanthanide ions have been, um, um, are pH sensitive as well. So ligand field is actually quite important for um, paramagnetic metal binding sites. Um, in summary, this table presents uh, numerical values for uh, key paramagnetic properties of lanthanide ions and other metal ions. Um, that uh, can be used for um, um, either PRE or PCS measurements. Um, as you can see, and as I um, said earlier in the previous slides, uh, TB and TM have the highest, um, highest tensor. Um, I've also highlighted cobalt here um, because it presents the highest value among the um, old transition metal ions and and is one of the naturally occurring um, paramagnetic metal ions inside the cells. And also, uh, we can see here that um, gadolinium has the um, very long uh, relaxation time and also the very small tensor. So it makes it very suitable for PRE measurements. Um, to make any paramagnetic NMR measurements meaningful, um, an appropriate diamagnetic reference is necessary. Um, as I mentioned earlier, PREs, uh, PCSs, and RDCs are all calculated by comparing the chemical shifts of um, a paramagnetic sample and a diamagnetic reference. Now that we know about paramagnetic metal ions, uh, we should know the best uh, diamagnetic counterparts and we have to use an appropriate diamagnetic reference for them. Um, for example, um, for iron, um, we can use um, gallium and zinc. For cobalt, um, we can use zinc. Uh, and for lanthanide ions, we have these options. And for the most common lanthanide ions, however, that we use for P PCS measurements, um, we can use um, yttrium as the domain reference. So knowing a bit, uh, a, a bit about the uh, metal ions available uh, to attach to proteins, and that question is, um, how do we attach these paramagnetic metal ions to the proteins? Um, so in the next few slides, I will present different ways of attaching a paramagnetic metal ion to proteins. Paramagnetic metal ion uh, can be introduced into proteins by different uh, means, uh, both for PRE and PCS measurements. Some proteins um, naturally contain metal ions as cofactors and bind to paramagnetic metal ions such as manganese, um, iron, uh, copper, and cobalt. And also uh, diamagnetic metal metal ions in metalloproteins can also be um, substituted for a paramagnetic metal ion. Um, for example, many uh, metalloproteins contain zinc, uh, which can be uh, substituted for cobalt. And this is why actually cobalt was highlighted in the table um, a few slides back. And this nice example also shows that, um, shows a protein that has a um, manganese binding site and also a protein that has a copper binding site. And the uh, uh, protein coordination with, it, with this metal is also shown in, um, in the two figures at the bottom. Um, and if, if the protein doesn't have a, a natural metal binding site um, and engineered engineering 
way of uh, an engineered binding site um, can be introduced through ligation of a metal complex with cysteine or an unnatural amino acid. Um, in cysteine ligation method, um, we just need to have a um, solvent exposed cysteine residue. Um, if the protein has a cysteine residue, uh, good. If not, we have to find a, um, a solvent exposed residue uh, to mutate it to cysteine residue and then lanthanide iron um, binding tag can be ligated into cysteine. Um, and also for in um, unnatural amino acid incorporation method, um, paramagnetic metal iron binds either directly to, to the unnatural amino acid or uh, through an intermediate um, lanthanide binding tag. In the next few slides, I'll explain more about the, the cysteine ligation and unnatural amino acid method. Um, in terms of uh, cysteine ligation, there are um, a good variety of um, synthetic lanthanide tags for cysteine ligation, such as um, ED, EDTA tag, uh, base tags, or uh, DDPA tags, or um, Taha base tags. Um, but among them, um, uh, cyclone-based tags are more popular. Uh, they offer very high affinities for lanthanide ions and are used uh, preloaded for you um, with lanthanide ions prior to protein attachment. They can be um, attached to one or two amino acid residues in a protein, um, leading to um, double arm cyclone tags or single arm. Uh, cycling tags. Um, I think so far five um, double arm cycling tags um, have been reported. Um, there is clear evidence that anchoring of the tags via two arms leads to improved metal immobilization relative to the biomolecule and correspondingly larger delta contents and magnitude but it also requires the identification of two sites that offer the right geometry for uh, proper attachment of that um, double arm tags. For example, this tag here, uh, clamp five, has become the um, double arm lanthanide tag most frequently used for um, paramagnetic um, NMR spectroscopy. Um, for single arm cycling tags, um, these are usually immobilized the metal ion less well than the double arm analogs, um, but it is easier to find appropriate tagging sites for them in biomolecules. The tagging reaction itself um, is, is also more straightforward with single arm tags, um, as obviously double arm tags can result in um, uh, dual taggings and some, uh, you know, cross-linking, intermolecular cross-linking as well, which is um, not desirable. Um, um, enantiomers C1, uh, C2 tags are um, popular single arm cycling tags, which have been used widely. Um, they reliably produce single delta cartenses and they're reactive uh, thiopyridyl amoidy afford facci ligation to um, cysteine residues by spontaneous um, disulfide exchange reaction. And also here on the right, um, you can also see a successful attachment of um, C1 tag at position um, alanine 28 um, in ubiquitin protein. Um, as um, mentioned earlier, the, another way of um, attaching a paramagnetic center in protein is uh, through unnatural amino acid. Um, we have unnatural amino acid incorporation in protein um, using paraisid of uh, alanine, uh, which is an unnatural amino acid that can be um, site specifically incorporated into protein by genetic encoding. Um, where an amber stop codon, um, a suppressor tRNA, and um, an um, and amino acid tRNA synthetase are used to direct the incorporation of um, unnatural amino acid. Um, for 
information about um, Unnatural Amnesty Incorporation, I would suggest reading this review by uh, Peter Schultz. So to attach lanthanide ions to unnatural amino acid, um, in particular paracetophilic alanine, um, C3 and C4 tags, which are cycling-based tags, um, have, uh, have been used as um, a clickable um, lanthanide probes for NMR purposes. These tags um, comprise alkyne moieties that uh, selectively can react with um, unnatural amino acid in a copper catalyzed reaction. Um, C3 uh, produces better Q factors in this way, um, but C3 and C4 both have uh, similar data contents. Uh, this tagging approach is um, very attractive because it is independent of cysteine residue, uh, which often are essential for maintaining the protein structure and function. And obviously, if, if a protein naturally has a cysteine residue, um, we don't have to mutate that to um, any, um, anything else. This way to generate useful PCSs in, uh, in, the, in, in the target molecule, um, the tag must still fulfill the usual requirements of um, you know, the position of lanthanide ions should be uh, defined relative to the target protein um, with no mobility and have a unique coordination geometry. Um, this limits the choice of uh, reactive groups that can be used. Um, for example, um, modern copper-free approaches based on um, strain cyclooctines um, um, result in uh, diastereomeric uh, fetus, which in addition tends to be long and flexible. Um, in the case of uh, classical copper catalyzed click reaction, um, also the target molecules must tolerate the presence of copper ions in the solution as well. Um, also, on the other hand, um, about half of the target proteins exposed to click reaction condition were found to uh, precipitate. And, and also, if you're using a he stack for protein purification, uh, which is uh, frequently added to protein um, to, for purification, uh, would also, also interfere with the copper catalysis and must be cleaved off um, prior to click reaction. Um, there are also some PRE tags. Um, the main purpose of this uh, seminar is um, PCSs, but if I want to briefly mention um, the most popular one, I think is gadolinium, is a lanthanide tag. Um, the same, same strategies that I explained for um, PCS um, measurement for, um, for lanthanide binding tags for PCS measurements can also be used for uh, gadolinium tags. Um, gadolinium is widely used for PRE measurements and uh, in order to attach it to proteins um, uh, due to the chemical similarities that exist between lanthanide ions, um, same tags that um, mentioned in the previous slides um, can be used as well. Um, but however, PRE data from um, gadolinium tags are um, rarely used as the sole uh, distance restraints in structural biology projects. And that's because PCSs generated by other paramagnetic lanthanide ions yield more detailed structural information with higher sensi sensitivity over a, uh, a greater distance range uh, while being far less sensitive to um, intermolecular effects and also more tolerant with respect to incomplete um, tagging yields. Uh, nonetheless, PREs often uh, provide useful additional structural information complementary to PCSs. Um, more, I guess more popular than um, gadolinium PRE measurements in biomolecules are often um, performed by organic radicals, uh, spin labels, as spin labels, uh, which yield PREs without PCSs. And um, the most popular spin label is, um, is MTSL, which the structure is shown here. 
uh, which can be attached to proteins using um, cysteine ligation. Um, there are other tags, um, there are other metal ions that can be used for PRD measurements like manganese and copper, uh, which there are um, other tags for them to attach them to proteins as well. And this brings me to my uh, PhD research project um, where I developed a, a, a metal binding site for um, cobalt using natural histidines. Um, the reason um, we did that was um, PCSs, we know PCSs are uh, very useful and they, they, um, they produce valuable long range information in the study of proteins. Um, but however, interpretation of PCSs requires the complete immobilization of metal ions relative to the proteins, uh, which sometimes is difficult to achieve using uh, synthetic metal tags. That being reason one, uh, reason two, we also wanted to have um, a straightforward, inexpensive, convenient way of generating uh, PCS, um, precision PCSs in proteins to avoid having you know, too many steps of uh, mutating proteins, um, having cysteine, doing ligation, click chemistry, or, um, or other ways to attach the paramagnetic metal ion to the protein. And usually this um, will affect somehow the, the, the 3D structure of protein or uh, make the protein to be less soluble um, in solution. So we wanted to have um, a very nice, straightforward, um, convenient way of generating PCSs basically. Um, the quest for a rigid methyl binding probe that is broadly applicable and generates significant PCSs uh, prompt us to investigate the potential of double histidine um, motif um, for PCS, um, for generating PCSs. This idea of um, histidine binding to, to cobalt is, is not very old. Um, if you have done any histac protein purification, you know that histidine is bind to um, um, nickel or cobalt loaded columns. Um, but obviously cobalt is better than nickel in, in, um, in producing PCSs. Um, to test this, if this works, um, I just had to do a very simple experiment of um, making these mutations and just purifying the protein using a cobalt loaded column. So if the protein binds to the, co uh, the column, uh, that shows that uh, the binding is um, um, the binding affinity is good enough to actually hold the protein inside the column. And that shows, you know, we can, we can do the further experiments. Uh, so I tested two different versions of um, this double histidine uh, cobalt complex, one on um, alpha helix and one on uh, beta strand in I and I plus two position on beta strand and I and I plus four on alpha helix. Uh, there are so many advantages to this system. Uh, it can, ob obviously it's cheap, it's, it's easy, it can be engineered by changing only two amino acid residues in protein, and then you're good to go. You don't need any additional purification tags, because um, these histidines can, can uh, be used as, a per uh, as the protein purification tags as well. Um, the good thing about them is in order to have them on alpha helix, you don't need to have the 3D structure of the protein. Um, the alpha helical um, of any protein can reliably be uh, predicted by, uh, by the um, amphiphilic characters. And the other thing is this double histidine cobalt motif is um, compatible with solvent exposed cysteine residue. So if the protein that we're studying has a cysteine residue, um, we can keep it, uh, we just have to keep it reduced for NMR measurements, but we don't have to um, get rid of it. And, um, and in the paper that uh, referenced here, we showed, um, we did uh, PCS and RDCs, and we showed that um, 
double histidine uh, motif uh, provides the most rigid metal, metal binding sites for protein and um, is capable of delivering structural restraints of uh, exceptional quality. So having all these informations, um, in the next part of the seminar, I will uh, talk about how to use PCSs uh, in particular for protein structure determination. Before anything, um, I just want to briefly say a few things about PCSs and how to actually uh, measure them um, in NMR. Um, once you have successfully immobilized a paramagnetic metal ion on a protein, um, PCSs can easily be measured by um, just running the HSQC experiment. But in practice, you need two HSQC experiments for, um, for proteins tagged with paramagnetic and one with diamagnetic metal ion to measure PCSs. Um, and then you simply can subtract the chemical shift of paramagnetic sample from uh, diamagnetic sample for each residue, and that gives the PCS for each residue. As you can see, for example, for this residue, the chemical shift of um, protein tagged with um, paramagnetic metal ion minus the chemical shift of the diamagnetic reference can give you uh, the PCS for this um, specific residue. Um, and something that I forgot to mention is, um, is the sensitivity of uh, HSQC experiments, which is um, obviously a lot higher than um, for um, measuring NOEs in, in, um, for proteins. And it can work with um, very lower concentration of proteins and um, in, a, in a shorter times. So I guess now that we have measured PCSs, um, we just have to know how to use these um, PCSs for structure um, determination. Um, to answer this question, we have to understand the underlying equation to calculate PCSs. And this is the equation that we use to calculate PCSs. Um, for a nuclear spin, um, E which uh, with distance R from uh, the paramagnetic um, center, I here, the PCS can be described by the simple um, equation that reflects the location um, relative to the paramagnetic center. Uh, this equation has um, eight variables um, and therefore at least eight PCSs. So if we measure eight PCSs from this HSQC experiment, which uh, for, for this instance, we have um, a lot more than eight, we can solve this equation and then we can find all these para parameters and then find that the, um, the exact location of this um, um, nuclear um, atom from the paramagnetic center. But this requires you to have uh, the 3D structure of the protein. Um, this means if we could measure PCSs for each nuclear spin from HSQC spectra, we can calculate the distance uh, from the paramagnetic metal center, um, which we know the location of because we designed the tag to be in that specific location. Um, so therefore, if we, if we follow these simple steps, we can produce some distance restraint. So um, measuring the HSQC experiments, uh, and then calculating the PCSs for each residue, having a table, um, having PCSs for each residue, and then uh, once PCS is calculated, program NumBat, or uh, there are some other programs that can be used for um, uh, calculation of delta car tensor, uh, which also present the delta car tensor by um, ISO surfaces uh, that trace the uh, coordinates of a certain PCS values. Um, NumBat is specifically designed for uh, the computation of complex set of delta car tensor parameters, including shape, um, location, and orientation with respect to the protein. Um, but then again, as, as I mentioned, 
to do this, um, you need to load your PDB file here. That means you need to know the protein structure. Um, the 3D structure by NMR has been mostly confirming the accuracy of 3D structure or refining it using uh, sparse experimental data. Um, but the main purpose of this presentation is um, we want to use PCSs to determine the structure of uh, proteins without knowing the 3D structure of the protein. Um, to do this, uh, we have to utilize Rosetta. Um, Rosetta algorithm is one of the most successful methods for de novo protein structure uh, prediction um, from um, amino acid sequence. Um, originally uh, developed in the, um, in the laboratory of Professor David Baker, University of Washington, um, as a comprehensive structure prediction tool, um, Rosetta now has evolved into a large collection of computer codes. Um, you can see here on the right the general um, workflow of Rosetta for protein uh, structure prediction. Um, Rosetta de novo structure prediction um, proceeds in two main steps um, involving a, a low resolution um, um, and a low resolution stage during which the conformational space is searched using a, um, a coarse grained energy function and a high resolution phase afterwards to refine the models uh, to generate um, generated in the first phase to um, using a physically more realistic pole uh, atom force field. Um, Rosetta has been particularly successful in producing correct models for small proteins only based on um, the amino acid sequence um, up to 100 residues. Um, however, for larger proteins, um, have more than 150 residues um, is a bit less efficient. Uh, but however, having some experimental data from NMR, including um, chemical shifts, um, help to, um, to find better structures. Um, for example, uh, there are programs um, like CS Rosetta that can include the chemical shifts um, into Rosetta calculations and um, um, to predict the secondary structure elements and guide the fragment selections um, in the first stage of Rosetta and constrain backbone um, torsion angles, um, which can uh, greatly improve the final yield of um, correctly for the protein models. Also, um, NOEs and RDCs can be included too. Um, and of course, PCSs uh, can be included too. Um, PCSs can be, um, can be used to select meaningful peptides uh, from the fragment library in the first step um, and, and avoiding the computationally expensive refinements of models built from um, inadequate fragments. Um, but there is a problem with PCSs uh, that even the best PCS tag still uh, produce uh, PRE effects. And these PRE effects um, um, kind of um, doesn't let us to measure PCSs for, for the few, um, a few residues around uh, in the vicinity of the metal binding site. This means PCSs um, cannot be measured for the, uh, for the atoms close to the paramagnetic center uh, due to the line broadening uh, caused by PREs. And also um, for, um, for the atoms far from the paramagnetic center, um, still the PCSs would be very small and um, we can't measure PCSs for them. But again, there is a solution for this. Um, which brings me to second part of my uh, PhD research. And that is including PCSs measured from attachment of paramagnetic center at four different uh, sites in proteins. Um, this figure might be a bit uh, misleading, but this is actually four different uh, samples superimposed on each other. And these sites, uh, this protein is tagged four different times in, at four different locations. Uh, this idea is inspired by how 
global positioning system or GPS works in pinpointing the exact location mm -hmm. of object on Earth, um, positioning four different paramagnetic sites on protein, uh, which can be viewed as satellites, can produce four sets of PCSs for distances. Uh, this way, we have information of the exact position of each atom in the protein and subsequently the 3D uh, structure of protein. This strategy works nicely uh, with the double histidine motif that I, um, uh, I explained a few slides back, um, which also was part, uh, was part of my PhD research project. Um, can, works nicely with that and can be introduced on the alpha helix of protein, uh, as I said, but just having the amino acid sequence of the protein. Uh, so to test this, um, I used a protein that has um, at least four um, alpha helices because I need to, to attach these on alpha helix. Um, so just based on the amino acid sequence, I, um, I prepared 10 different mutants and um, only four mutants that I've named uh, mutant one, two, and three, and four um, were resulted in good sizable PCSs. Um, obviously because the mutations were designed based on amino acid sequence and um, some of the mutations are, um, are mutating out some charged residues on the alpha helix, which um, can be detrimental to the protein and protein either precipitates or it doesn't even express in, in the cells. So, but we, um, I got what I needed, which was four different working mutants can, that can generate uh, uh, good sizable PCSs for me. Um, as I shown here, um, from the four different mutants that I had, I could record a um, total of 286 PCSs. Um, and uh, PCSs from each mutant is shown here by different color. Um, I could measure at least one PCS for each residue um, for all non-proline residues, uh, which is great um, because we have at least one distance restraint for all the residues in the protein. Um, I could measure two PCSs at least for more than 90% of the residues in the protein, um, if we exclude the flexible N and C terminal um, um, part of the protein. And more than 65% of the residues had um, uh, three PCSs for them. Um, the model proteins that we used here um, has a crystal structure, but uh, to show that this method works for proteins with unknown structures, um, 20,000 all atom models uh, were calculated using non-homologous fragment library of Rosetta um, that explicitly ex excluded any fragments that um, were from previously determined structure of ERP29. Uh, the models were screened um, for the subset of models with uh, low PCS deviations um, where the metal coordinate, coordinates at each of the four double, double histidine sites fulfilled the expected geometry of um, double histidine motif, um, double histidine cobalt motif. Um, then I picked the, the top 10 structures, which I've shown here in blue that have the lowest RMSD um, to the known structure of the protein and lowest PCS and Rosetta energy. And then I've used these 10 structures for further analysis. Um, here you can see the uh, structural similarities between the top 10 uh, ensembles um, and the, the known structure of the protein. And as you can see the top uh, top 10 uh, conformers are individually aligned and, um, and the alignment is, except the, um, the N-terminal and C-terminal part, which is unstructured. Um, the, the rest of the protein have a very good alignment with the, um, the non-protein structure. Um, 
for comparison, the top 10 um, uh, structures display an average uh, pairwise uh, C-alpha RMSD of 1.8 angstrom for residues, um, excluding the flexible um, N-terminal C-terminal residues. Um, although the input didn't have any experimental restraints from amino acid side chains, uh, the top 10 conformers displayed um, uh, well defined conformations for some of the buried amino acid residue side chains, as shown here. And also, um, here I've assessed the contribution of each PCS data sets uh, from four different mutants. Um, uh, to the structure calculation and uh, the performance of PC, uh, each PCS data set was um, um, analyzed individually. And as you can see, all four um, PCS data sets uh, contributed to the convergence of um, the Rosetta modeling. And finally, um, uh, this is the top one structure which has the lowest RMSD um, and is superimposed to the previously determined uh, structure of um, the RP29. Um, the C alpha RMSD of top one was um, uh, 1.5 angstrom for um, more than 95 aligned atoms, again excluding the um, C terminal and terminal flexible part of the protein. So um, in conclusion, um, generating PCSs with um, natural amino acids rather than uh, synthetic lanthanide tags is uh, economically advantageous. Um, solvent exposed surfaces of, um, and uh, of the helix can be identified from amino acid sequence. Um, a similar approach was taken um, by another member of the group to tag the same protein uh, with lanthanide ions at four different sites. Um, unexpectedly, it proved to be easier to achieve uh, a high PCS coverage of the protein with double histidine uh, mutants um, than with lanthanide tags, despite the fact that um, PCSs from cobalt obviously are um, smaller than the PCSs from lanthanide ions. And this clearly shows that um, alpha helical double histidine cobalt motif carries great promise for uh, determination of 3D fold of proteins. And PCSs of um, uh, backbone MI proteins generated by double histidine motif and multiple sites uh, can be harnessed to, uh, uh, to determine the uh, protein fold of uh, the fold of the proteins. Um, so I guess as I have presented some of my PhD um, research um, here, it is appropriate to have an acknowledgement uh, slide here. I greatly thank for Professor Odin for um, the PhD opportunity and the Australian National University and Australian Research Council who funded these um, research projects. Um, that's all from me. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much for that excellent talk, Alireza. We have several questions in the Q&A uh, and also a couple of questions from Adrian uh, in the chat box. So if you could also uh, open the Q&A, um, we could just uh, go through uh, the questions that are posted there already. The first I question, can't... sorry, what's yeah. that? It's just I can't open the Q&A unless I stop sharing my screen. I okay, uh, it, it's fine. You don't have to uh, open it. I will read out the questions myself too. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. So the first question is from an anonymous attendee. How can one confirm that a paramagnetic tag will not modify the protein structure or function? Um, there are um, the, the simplest way that I used to do was just looking at the HSQC experiments. Um, to me, HSQC experiment is like a, a fingerprint of each protein. And, um, and also the, the shape of the cross peaks in HSQC can, can tell you a lot about the um, line broadening or, um, um, or structural, if the, if the 3D structure of the protein is uh, disturbed. 
that's like, I think the simplest way to, to say is just by looking at the HSQC experiment. Out of curiosity, uh, this is from me, you're referring to a proton N15 HSQC, is it? Out of yeah. proton carbon, okay. Uh, the second question is also from an anonymous attendee, and it's about using Rosetta with long range restraints from PCSS. Would the paramagnetic tag itself be included in the Rosetta structure calculation? Um, no, we just include the, we just include the uh, PCSs um, for uh, structural calculation. And then once we have the structures, we can uh, screen them and see which structures actually can produce, can actually satisfy this geometry of the tag and also can produce um, good quality factors with the PCSs that we've um, used as input for um, um, Rosetta calculations. Sounds good. The next question is from another anonymous attendee, and it's a question from slide 23. Uh, with your four mutants, you observed at least one PCS for all non-proline residues. Why yeah. were no PCS is observed for proline residues? Uh, because um, we only use the PCS of um, MI protons and um, obviously you can't see prolines in the HSQC, in N15 HSQC. So, um, so that's why we didn't have any PCSs for them. The next question is also from an anonymous attendee. Could you please comment on the range of measurable attend distances when using COBOL? COBOL gives very small PCS as far as I know. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a compromise that you, you exchanging high PCSs with, um, um, with more PCSs. Um, so COBOL can, can ha have a better co um, cover of or can cover most of the, can, can produce PCSs for most of the residues in, in, in the protein, um, but at the same time, PCSs are um, a lot smaller. But I guess uh, because we have four different, we have tagged four different sites in the protein, um, we have a good, um, um, I think we have good, at least the size of the PCSs um, can also cover each other as well. Okay, the next question is from Adrian. He said, this is a very nice description of the available tags. If I'm in a lab which is interested in dipping our toes into some paramagnetic NMR of biomolecules, but we aren't quite certain about where we want to invest in the materials uh, to produce the tag proteins, is there some interesting data that can be gotten from adding paramagnetic ions to solution and maybe hoping for some transient binding of the ions? with that protein of interest? Um, obviously, uh, it is something doable, but um, the problem would be if, if there is no clear idea of binding site for that paramagnetic metal ion to the protein, um, and or if there is multiple binding sites on, in the protein, um, the, the delta chitons that are produced would be, um, would be kind of quite useless because um, it will come from averaging all these delta chitinses that are produced from binding to multiple sites on proteins. Uh, that's why all these paramagnetic centers have to be engineered on proteins so you know exactly where to expect them and you base your calculations on. Um, so, for example, what we did here for histidines, we, we investigated fully how this cobalt is binding to histidines. Um, there was a part of my PhD research that I didn't present here, but it was only studying um, using um, HNHB experiments or COSY experiments just to find that the geometry of this uh, and, and, the, and the angles of how these histidines actually coordinates to bind to cobalt. So knowing th those details and information about the binding uh, binding method and um, but the coordination of metal ions to the um, to the power magnetic metal center is really important. There's one final question from Adrian again. 
One of the benefits of paramagnetic NMR is that with shorter T1s, it's possible to use shorter cycle delays and increase the signal to noise with respect to time in the, invested in an experiment. With specific binding of a paramagnetic center, do we get this advantage too? Or are there, other, are there nuclei that are too far away from our paramagnetic centers that won't have shorter T1s? Yeah, as, uh, as I mentioned, um, obviously for, um, for, the, for the residues that are far from the metal binding site, uh, the PCSs would be very small, uh, especially when, you, um, when, you, when you're working on a very large protein, um, more than 150, 200 residues, uh, even lanthanide ions might not reach to the, uh, to the residues at the very far from that binding site. Um, I think the longest distance that I've seen measured for uh, by PCSs is, is around 40 angstrom, and obviously there are many proteins that you know are bigger than that. Um, so that's why this approach of having multiple binding sites on on, on a protein can help to achieve that um, having at least one PCS for um, each residue in the protein. All right, so there's one more question uh, in the Q&A box from an anonymous attendee. What's the maximum distance when using cobalt? Um, it's a good question. Um, I haven't calculated yet, but um, for, for the protein that I used, which was around um, 140, with the tag that I have 100, 140, 140 to 150, um, I could see PCSs for, uh, for most of the residues in the protein. I guess that helps. That would answer the question. Sounds good. I don't have an exact number of like angstrom um, distance, but in terms of protein size, um, up to 140, 150 you can measure PCSs for residues. All right, there's uh, one, more one more question. Great talk, could you comment on the effects of residual CSA on PCS measurements? Our effect of, sorry, what? At the effects of residual chemical shift and isotropy on PCS measurements. Um, I, if, if that means, um, if that question refers to uh, the effects that um, line broadening of um, uh, have that in PCS measurements, um, I guess depending on the, the metal ions that we use, um, I guess this is a lot bigger for lanthanide ions than um, in, uh, transition metal ions like cobalt. Um, there are there is a bigger area of the protein that will be affected by um, by that um, near the metal binding sites. Um, for example, for for what I observed for cobalt was um, only three residues before and after the metal binding sites were affected, um, whereas this is um, I think um, a lot bigger for lanthanide ions. 